Hi everybody, I'm Wendy Murdoch and this is Webinars with Wendy. I've been doing a series of webinars during the pandemic, but the information has been so incredible and my guests are so amazing that I'm really hoping I'm going to keep this going long after I go back to teaching. Today my guest is Paige Poss. She's actually from Virginia, but she's a transplant out to Arizona. And our paths crossed briefly at Dr. Joyce Harmon's. I knew she was doing some amazing stuff and she has just incredible visual aids to help you understand the horse's hoof. And so I'm so pleased to have her as my guest today. Please welcome Paige Poss. Good morning, everybody. I look forward to doing this. Um, I do miss Virginia at the moment. We had 113 degrees when I was working the other day, which is um, miserable, but believe it or not, it's not as bad as it sounds. It, sound, it feels like a 99 degree day with humidity. Because <laughs> it's pretty dry out there, right? That really makes yeah. a difference. And, and that really does make a difference, but you know, it is funny. It's a dry heat. It's still miserable. <laughs> So, so Paige, get, tell us how you wound up doing what you're doing now. I know that it's been a really interesting journey. Well, I'm going to kind of cover that in the PowerPoint, but yes, I, I went, have been doing hoof care since 99, and then I moved into doing anatomy, and it's like one of those situations where it's not what I dreamed of doing when I grew up is cutting up horse legs, but it serves a really big purpose, and it's, it's become, you know, one of those passions that has helped me um, feel like I've made a difference in the world. Yeah, and um, I've seen some of the, the images that you have, like we were both at Hoof Summit, but of course we were both too busy to kind of get together. But I've, you know, Joyce has shared some of your work with me and it's just, I'm, it's really amazing. So, so maybe it's the best thing is to just go ahead and get started with the PowerPoint then and we can find out more about you and uh, joining with coffee. Good idea. I, I'm, <laughs> these morning I'm with you. <laughs> yeah, let's go ahead and get started. And I, you know, any questions or anything afterwards or even during. So, so what I typically do is have people, please put your questions in the chat or the Q and a, um, as opposed to raising your hand. I, I have yet to get the hang of hand raising and, and allowing people to speak. So it's just easier if you type it into the comments, into the chat or into the Q&A. And then I'll ask Paige in the appropriate moment when I think there's a, a, a good time to ask that question. So please do ask your questions in that manner. All right. And this is really short. It's just, um, it'll kind of set up any questions people might have. So here we go, am I sharing screen? Yep. <clears throat> Are we going? Yep. Cool. All right. So I just put together this little uh, slideshow to kind of tell the story on how I got started. But I started trimming hooves and, and really had no idea that trimming the hooves was literally only the beginning. That is the starting point. It's even though I'm still trimming actively today, that is not the most important lesson that I had to learn. So back in 99, I brought home this poor soul. He was only four years old, but he, he already had a lot of hoof problems and he was lame. So I got on the internet, saw something about trimming laminated course. I was everybody's worst nightmare, you know, got on the internet, picked up tools. So I rolled up my sleeves and I started trimming. And then I had immediate success. This horse turned around so quickly and um, he got more sound, happier. He started moving forward and I thought I knew what I was doing. So <laughs> that proved to be my greatest downfall. <laughs> So soon I was. Can I interrupt you for a second? I don't think you actually um, started your PowerPoint because we get the two slides. Like we're getting your view instead of just the single slide view. Ah, let's do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because otherwise we have all your little pictures at the bottom, and I don't want people to jump in ahead. How about that? Oh, there we go. Great. Awesome. See, I'm more flexible than you'd think. <laughs> <laughs> 
So anyway, I was hooked. And soon I started trimming basically anything that would stand still long enough. Um, you know, I, I really enjoyed trimming. And then my Arab, who I'd had prior to bringing home paint, he was one of my also first guinea pigs. And um, then I bought a farm. And well, I started dragging thing. home the lame and the insane. What, what year was this? 1999. Oh, wow. And that's the year I moved to Virginia. <laughs> well, I moved to Virginia in 2000 um, is when we bought the farm. And this is when I started dragging everybody home. So every horse that I drug home was a little unhealthier than the one before. Right down to this one. Wow. And but, where did you find them? Where did I find them? Well, the bulk of these came from North Carolina, where I had just moved from. And then um, Animal Control had um, gone in and rescued the little black and white. And the other one, somebody just had a really sore, pathetic, laying down pony that she also brought to my place. So I had two matching ponies that my now ex-husband said he used to go out and put a mirror in front of their nose every morning to make sure they were still alive because they were pretty pathetic. Um, but I was absolutely convinced I was going to, um, that proper trimming was going to save them. I did improve their, their um, feet, but it wasn't just the feet. And what I didn't understand is that I had so much more to learn that um like this pony and so it was her health that was bad it wasn't her just her feet and and that's where i needed to understand that the overall health of the horse um was vital many diseases are reflected in the feet like laminitis and laminitis is one of the first symptoms you'll find in horses that are starting to suffer from Cushing's disease. And it's the one that farriers or your hoof care provider is gonna notice way before you see coat changes and other things. It's, it's definitely one of the things I see the earliest in horses. And this poor pony, look at her. I mean, she's just a textbook for PPID or Cushing's disease. And I didn't know anything about that then. Um, the other thing, Lyme disease. In Virginia, I have to say, I do not miss Lyme disease. I'm not having to deal with that here. And um, that's another one that just causes so many problems with the feet. And it's just, it's not obvious. Like you think you're just doing something wrong. The owner thinks you're doing something wrong. It, it just is hard to manage as long as you don't have Lyme disease under control. So, you know, I was never going to fix this pony with just trimming. Luckily, she did get more comfortable with good trimming, but it, def it didn't help as much as I would have liked. You know, the confirmation and genetics is going to play a huge role. And, you know, the way a horse loads his legs and loads his feet is going to influence the hoof capsule. You just can't get around it. The hoof capsule is is subject to pressures. And if they're loading incorrectly, the hoof capsule is gonna change. So, you know, the, the foot on the left is, is an upright, that horse is, even if you drop the heels and stuff, you don't necessarily get the results that you want. Um, the other thing is, this is confirmation, genetics, injuries, this poor mare was windswept. Um, luckily, she had someone who was very meticulous with her feet, who kept her going for years, and the mare was happy. But as you can see, her body was <laughs> a little. So, what, if, if you, what is the definition of windswept for those who haven't heard that term before? When she was born, it's like her legs went to the side. Maybe you can describe it better than I can. Um, if you've ever seen a windswept, if you look at 
this mare's front legs, sometimes both front legs will be swept to one side. Sometimes all four legs will be um, affected. And then sometimes the front end will go one direction and the hind end will curl the other direction. But and if you look at her rib cage, in the womb, right? I mean, they're born yeah, there. They, yeah. it's, the theory is it's positional in the womb. But, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there is some element of confirmation or genetics that play a part, but I don't know that. But you can only imagine that um, this was going to be a horse that just trimming was not going to fix. Right. And so I have a science degree and that that led me, and I'm also a very visual learner. So I needed to understand the hoof better than just trimming. And anatomy books really didn't do it for me. I needed to understand not the terminology of anatomy, and that's what most of the anatomy books do. They help you label things. They help you know the names of things. But I wanted desperately to understand the function and the mechanics of what I was dealing with. And of course, I started out hyper-focused on the foot and started doing dissections there. I also, the next part of my learning was realizing that um, not all the damage can be repaired with trimming, that there's a lot of damage that, that isn't going to repair. That's when I started understanding for real. That's when I began realizing the part that I play. I'm going to, you know, trim to the best of my ability, but that's all I can do as a health care provider. <clears throat> So I started doing the dissections and documenting my dissections with photographs. And that way I could look at them, study them more, study them in depth, comparative so, so anatomy became. I, I know this is gonna be a question, so I better ask it now. Mm -hmm. Where did you get your legs? Um, a variety of places. Um, Sometimes I would have owners who knew what I was doing and they'll donate legs to me. The other um, thing is there was rendering plants that if you, you had to set up a relationship with people. You couldn't just go in and, and say, give me your legs. Um, exactly. That's why I'm like, I, I know that well, you have a lot of pictures. It took years and years and years and I finally got a relationship with the necropsy lab um, in Virginia and, you know, just a few other places. And, and it's sketchy. It, it's getting harder and harder as time goes on. Um, even the people who pick up um, horses out here, they're reluctant to let me have the legs because they don't want to upset the owners. And um, even if, you know, it, it's, this is becoming a real issue. Even vet schools can't hardly get legs. So I'll just so you put it started, out there. So you just started and you got one leg and you decided to take a look. Yes. And what year was that? 2000. 2000. So, so 20 years ago, I hate to say it, 20 years yes. ago. Yes, isn't that crazy? Well, and that's the thing is people ago. don't realize how long you have actually been doing this and how... Right. And one of the first places I got legs was at Virginia Tech through their necropsy lab. lab. And, um, and then, and so yeah, I got started a long, long time ago. And then I kind of don't know how I fell into finding legs here and there. Um, and so you just decided to just take a leg and look underneath the hoof and see what was going on? I mean, was it just a clinic with um, a hoof care provider, Martha Levo. Okay, did a clinic at my place and she took apart legs before doing a trimming okay. clinic. And so that was kind of the first, but I, like I said, I was a lab tech and worked in research. Before. What kind of research were you doing? Um, I worked in the biochemistry department working with pigs all through college. And then I worked in, at um, NC State, that was at NC State. And then I worked in a in a lab that was um, doing repro stuff. 
Oh, when wait. was that? That's what my degree is in. <laughs> really? That yeah, was with reproductive physiology. I have a master's from UK. Yeah. Well, it's it's too funny because then I worked in reproductive toxicology at EPA, and I worked in the teratology department, doing a lot of tissue culture and and um, histology and stuff like that. So this is kind of up my alley. And then well, I worked. It. And when you said you you know you had a, so your de what is your degree in, and where did you go to school? I went to NC State and I got an animal science degree and it animal science degree really was a pre-vet degree. And I got down to the end and just realized I did not have it in me to go to school another four or five, six years. Right. And, you know, it was one of the hardest decisions ever to decide not to go because that's what I was groomed to do. I, I grew up in a dog show family. Um, Anybody ever seen the movie Best in Show? Oh, I love that movie. <laughs> my mom's credited in that movie. You are? <laughs> my mom is. Your mom, wow. So that was my life as a child. And that movie is not as off base as you would like to think. <laughs> oh, no. I know that that movie is actually closer to reality than one can imagine. So, oh, so that's interesting. So you grew up with your mom with dogs and you went to uh, NC State and got a degree in animal science heading out of that track but then you worked in a lab. See, because there's a, and the reason I ask this is we don't just land into these projects. Like I'm exactly. still doing biomechanics, even if I'm not getting a, you know, working in a university. Um, and the fact that you did histology, which is something that I did in my research when I worked at Dartmouth Med, um, I used to work on amyloidosis. Um, but that now I start to understand more how this became about. And that's, mm -hmm. I always find that curious. So, so then in 2000, you had a workshop at your place with Martha LeBeau, is that right? Olivo. Olivo. And mm -hmm. so she took apart a leg and light bulbs go on and you're like, okay, I need to find a leg. Yes. And what was so interesting is the fact that I wanted to touch, feel, experience and learn from the feet, but yet learning the names of everything was just secondary. Yeah, and because that's such a removed, uh, it's just a rote memorization to sit there and learn anatomy by rote names. And it doesn't have any life to it. I, you know, I, I've been there, so I understand it totally. <laughs> yep. And I, you know, like I said, I was groomed to be a veterinarian and, and disappointed my mother in that aspect. But, um, but we also, the other part of my upbringing which was just as vital, was we were a very hands-on family. I mean, my family could have done HGTV shows. I mean, <laughs> the major home renovation stuff that we used to do. It was nothing to rip out the whole kitchen, change the wiring, the plumbing, walk on floor joists, because there's no flooring for a week and, and stuff. But it was a, a very hands-on, tool-oriented family. So, you know, and then... On top of that, the other part was that my mother, my grandmother, and my all and my aunt, all three owned picture frame galleries. So I grew up with lots of art, lots of, you know, mechanical cutting glass, cutting mats. So the the anatomy became a culmination of all these things in my life. And that's what I find so fascinating is that, you know, we don't just fall into these things, uh, uh, you know, with, without some kind of pre, something happening in our life that leads us there. And, and so your experience of doing building and construction and, and the picture frame business, it makes sense that you would want to understand the bones and the innate structure of the foot from that inner level, because that's what you're doing when you're ripping apart a house, you're getting down to the bones. Yes. Um, here we're getting down to the, not the outside of the foot, but the inside of the foot. And in a way, the wall is simply the picture frame, isn't it? It really is. And, and the coffin bone is the trellis that everything's built around. Awesome. It's scaffolding. That's so now I, I have more of a sense of how you wound up do, doing this. So, okay, so onward. <laughs> well, and then, you know, as I started um, photo documenting everything, I began to realize the impact these images had on my learning and my understanding. And then these two images here are a series from a um, Exploring Laminitis book that 
I'll go into in a minute with a business partner that I have. And the impact of comparing relatively normal to abnormal is way more impactful too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Having that contrast is really important. Because I've done a lot of dissection clinics and sometimes I'll have a really diseased um, hoof that I'm taking apart. But if I don't have an, anything relatively normal, people don't understand how bad it is. Right. So that was, you know, that's, and also the fact that getting cadaver feet is not always easy and a lot of people don't have access to this. It felt important to me to, to put this information out there because for the people who are interested and learn more like I do, that they would have an opportunity to take away. And it means more each horse that's a part of these is teaching so many more people. Every time I go and give a clinic and there's, you know, 25 or 30 professionals there, I'm in awe of how many horses I'm actually helping. Yes. And, and that's one of the things that I think is so uh, important about your work is, is, um, is exactly that, that unless we understand, if you don't know, you don't know, right? And telling somebody something because they, they don't know, it, we have to educate, we've got to learn, we've got to have contrast. And I always talk about contrast in my teaching, you know, like I only do one leg on a student and they all complain, but how do you know what's different if you don't have contrast? Exactly, exactly. So as I put these images together, there was another um, woman who had been doing hoof care as long as I had, but she was a graphic designer also. And we hooked up and that's Jenny Edwards. She has all natural horse care. And she's the reason that these images are so meticulously put together. She's taught me so much about putting information together and then trying to combine as much. This is a page in our hoof distortion book that's just showing you a toe that's long and showing you where the coffin bone is in there. And, and you know, a, a relatively normal versus one of those dub toes of a back foot. But these are the way that you can start understanding three-dimensionally what's going on inside a foot. And that's, you know, the type of work that we're trying to do. And then, you know, and then doing, Eventually, I got out of the hoof, and we, we called the business that we created together Anatomy of Equine, but we laughed because we really haven't made it above the knee yet. <laughs> One day, we did do a dental book, but, <laughs> but it's like we've got a lot of horse to cover to uh, live up to our name. <laughs> and so, so like, you'll take, take a hoof. Can you go back to the other side? Like mm -hmm. these hoof pictures in the middle, you've obviously taken a hoof, and have you... Um, actually cut the foot in half and then and then I boiled out the bone say it again I boiled out the bones on half the foot and then I glued it back on and matched it so that's how you know I have the alignment correct and everything and that's that's where like this line is showing you your palmer angle wow so so literally you're you're taking these feet you're processing them so that you have the comparison and then you're reconstructing them and then you're photographing them and then there's graphic design and then we get these incredible images. Oh yeah. <laughs> and how long does it take you to process? Say, uh, the, yeah. <laughs> like, I just can't imagine how long it takes. Um, well, are the I found cool? Is there any way we can enlarge any one of those images, Paige? Because there's so many on the page there, on the page page. Um, do you, or maybe the next slide. The next slide has some bigger ones, but it's not on this one. I could always throw it on another slide and enlarge it to some extent. Yeah. Uh, because some of the detail here, I think, is so incredible. Um, well, that was the thing, is I just wanted people to see. But if you want me to indulge you, I'm going to go out and you're going to see my screen and I will... Well, if you, yep, there we go. Hold on, I can do this. Yep. I'm pretty adept at this. I do this all day long. 
Um, and somebody's already asking if there's books. And yes, we'll get to all that at the end of the webinar because the page, the, this is just the beginning of some of the uh, material that Paige has. Right, I really didn't bring in that much of it. Um, not, I don't know why, I just didn't. <laughs> all right, let's go back to, Oh, it's yeah. rolling in, that's where. Really Can you well. see a little bit better now? Yep, that's better. And so like, okay, so you took a photograph of the foot before you did anything to it. And then you've, you've obviously cut it in. Um, in half with a bandsaw. Right, in half. And so then we get the picture of the foot in the upper right where we can see the, the, the organization of the foot from a lateral view. Yes. Uh, and then you've boiled it down, the half of it, and then put the coffin bone back in, and then we get the uh, Palmer view, right? Palmer view? Uh, that's the solar view. Solar view, there we go. Um, and, and this lateral view, actually, I, that is where I glued the coffin bone back on. So that's kind of adding a third dimension to the coffin oh, bone. Oh, okay. I see, what, I see what you're saying. It's a little more clear in the middle one where you can see the yes. color change of the bone that you've glued yep. back on. Yes. And then what do you do just out of curiosity? Cause I'm, I'm a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> How do you prep the half of the foot that's still not boiled down? That's got all the structures. Is that just frozen or do you, you see the ice crystals right here ah <laughs> uh, okay got it yeah because yeah, you know, so, I mean, things will start to de deteriorate if it gets too warm too fast right yeah and that's the other thing is that you know because i work with unfixed um specimens i have i have to work really hard and fast and on average, most of the dissections that I do, I would say I take anywhere from 800 to 2,000 pictures. Wow. And so, you know, when I, um, on our tendon and ligament book, I didn't put that picture in the, um, in this, but I did a whole forelimb, you know, just from the elbow down. And I worked 21 hours on just photographing that. And so know, this is a labor of love in it addition is. to curiosity. Yeah, it, it's 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 not easy, and it takes you know um, a nerdy nature. That's what all my friends are. Okay. <laughs> no, I have, I have great friends. <laughs> so. Um, but that goes into just being able to help people visualize. And the, the books that Jenny and I have created primarily sell because we marketed in the farrier industry. And, and I'm happy to say that our books go all over the world. You know, it, it's really awe-inspiring how many people buy them but what we have done is try to give communication tools we want these books to be um where a veterinarian can open it up and say this is where the the tear is in the tendon or ligament or this you know right help people understand a little bit better and um we also there's almost too much information for owners but we felt like going ahead and making things that were comprehensive enough for veterinarians and other professionals that what happened is um, professionals can use it, but owners can too. You might not need all of this information, but it still helps build that three dimension, um, that third dimension in your mind by seeing this and it might help you see that the toe is too long and you just really believe it. <laughs> yeah. You know, somebody's made a comment about the long toe and said that that one has the best Palmer angle of the three. Yes, it does. But yeah. it also, and, and what's in the book and not in here is that that foot 
when you look at the uh, sagittal cut though, you can see that the foot was really vulnerable that if that horse got laminitis, um, you can't see it as much here, but, but there was a stretching of the lamina here. Yeah. And the horse was any assault, maybe he starts getting um, Cushing's disease or something, and all of a sudden that foot is really vulnerable. So the palmar angle's good, but this leverage on the toe, yet it looked awesome. There was no stretch to the white line, but in the larger view, there is stretching internally of the white line. It was just fascinating. And see, that's something I had never seen before um, with taking one apart and doing it this way. I'm always experimenting with taking things apart. I'm <laughs> maniacal. But, um, but to see the stretch of the white line up close to the lamina and down at what you see externally looks normal. Right. It can be so deceiving, can't it? It really can. So it was a house of cards. This was a horse that looked good and probably would crash hard and fast. So, so we have a veterinarian on, on um, the webinar and she's Heather O'Leary and she's saying, this is why I recommend x-rays for all my patients at least every Absolutely. couple of years, even if they're sound. And yeah, because yep. what can appear really good on the outside may not be so good on the inside. Well, and that's why a, a page with a series of images like this is good for a vet to be able to go, listen, there's a lot going on inside of there. And, and and a radiograph is going to show us stuff that you're just not going to be able to see. But I'm telling you, we yeah. need to see this. And it's good to get those baselines and, and keep an eye on what's going on with, with the horses. Um, she says just a lateral and DP of each foot and it's not expensive. So it's, it's, you know, preventative medicine. I think we're starting to recognize in the horse world that preventative medicine is really important. And it's not something that I remember being emphasized when I was young, but uh, I think we're starting to see the value of it because of some of these things that are going on under the surface for yes. long periods of time that, uh, that some little incident happens and the whole house of cards falls down. And if we could catch it earlier, we'd be in much better shape. This is a gore. What is this? <laughs> okay. So this is one that I would love to, to tell, was it Dr. O'Leary? Was that yeah. Heather O'Leary? Mm -hmm. uh, she needs to add, or, or in my heart, my favorite radiograph is that 60 degree DP. It's almost like a, a view of taking for the navicular bone because you see the distal margin of the coffin bone. And the reason that, has become one of my favorites started with this dissection. So this was a foot and in Virginia, a foot like this is just exciting to have because I've got some foot to work with. I'm not trying to collect something that's not there on a flat footed warm blood or thoroughbred and, and like having vertical depth and a little bit of soul just was thrilling to me. And I often would see cracks like this and, and the horses were rarely, if ever, um, unsound from them. Cracks alarm owners the most, but I found they really, over the years, they cause the least amount of problems. But anytime I had ever, ever explored them with dissections, I'd always cut through the middle of them. That, you know, a lot of times like the sagittal cut, if I just came in and looked at the sagittal view of that cut in half, I would see that there were some changes, but this time I decided I was gonna take off the front of the foot to look at it. And these images are so impactful. This is just the lamina that's somewhat normal, but right here, that looks like sole corium. Wow. Look at the changes that are going on in here. And so you so, just, you literally took off the front hoof wall to expose yes. the lamina. And then the, the second picture, the one in the middle of the screen, is that just a- uh, This is the inside of the wall. So this is your dermal lamina. This is what's attached to the coffin bone. This is the- Oh, oh I see. Lamina. That's it's the inside the of the hoof wall. So this yeah. right here is following this. Right. So what is growing here is soul. 
And the reason is behind almost every crack, there's bone loss. Wow. And the bone loss is higher than you would expect. Or higher than I expected, at least. And I, let me see what else I have in here. Oh, I didn't throw in. Does anybody want me to indulge them and um, and throw in other images? Hold on, I've got a. Sure. <laughs> well, I've got one that I'm working on right now that. Yeah. Yep, everybody's in, uh, in for it. Okay, let's go. <laughs> All right, well. Um, and if you need to leave your PowerPoint to pull up a photo, just unshare your screen, go find I it. Did. You can, oh, wow, cool. That is what the epidermal lamina look like internally at the top of that crack. Wow. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Yeah. This is hard. And it ends up putting pressure on the coffin bone. And that's what I think created. Hold on, I gotta get back there. Well, and also it, it looks- That's like what created this divot in the coffin bone. It's, it's a cycle. What's happening? Are those um, epidermal lamina fusing and starting to create a pressure spot that's eroding the coffin bone or is it the other way around is it imbalances and some sort of mechanics and shear forces causing the problem luckily most horses with this aren't sore unless it's really big um i bet you this horse wasn't lame from that so it's one of the things that's fascinating is how the body is adapting to the fact that it has a crack and mm -hmm. the changes that are going on. Um, we do have a question. Let me just, um, sure. someone's saying that they have a, a New Jersey bred, standard bred Arab, never shod, turned out 24 seven, groundwork off lead, light work under saddle, uh, previously had pancake-ish long toe with two lateral cracks that are healed. Hoof currently sounds hollow or pithy, not like the other hooves. Any idea what that would that would cause? So again, a lot of times you've got some bone loss, um, and <clears throat> let me. Um, I'm going to show you one more quick image um, of another foot that had cracks, and then I'm going to show you one that's on the side that's a quarter crack. Look at the bone loss there. This is why I love those distal margin views because I did not expect to see that much bone loss on that foot. Wow. And then look at, again, you've got. Wow, that's a great shot because you can really see the pressure points. Pressure points, absolutely. All right, so these images, this hoof crack stuff is coming from uh, the hoof courses. So Jenny and I have, we started with these books and they're awesome, but you can only imagine if I've got 800 to 2000 pictures of each dissection, how heart wrenching it is to take and get down to like four photos <laughs> of a particular foot. So we've, we've put these PowerPoints together where we're able to basically take the books and bring in a lot more and put in a little bit of video and stuff. And it's a lot of heavy lifting. Um, soon the individual models, the modules will be available for sale right now. It's as a package because there's just a stupid learning curve to figuring out how to put these things together. And we well, just I'm a little confused. You're saying that you've done an online course where you take the yeah, it's called hook and and you go to anatomy of the equine and you can find it there and then it sends you to a website you can also go to hoofcourses.com and um those are all um this information is where i'm i'm 
recording, Jenny and I are recording these things and we've got seven or eight modules, but a lot of this information is, is blown So are up. you actually in those videos? Are you actually taking feet apart in those No, videos? it's all, it's more this type of stuff because okay. to, to get, I have little pieces, short clips of video, maybe as much as a minute, of taking things apart because adding a little bit of movement and all but to watch me take a foot apart the editing or just to watch it would be hours it's just okay so the so the course then isn't isn't like you doing this the course is more of this kind of information where we you actually take go take us through the thousands of photographs that you've done exactly of so that so basically it's the more in-depth course it's the more in depth of what um, you know you're seeing in the books. You don't get us explaining what we think we're seeing. Oh, okay, um, okay. But like here, this is a quarter crack, and what she was talking about. This one's really. Um, we're not. We're crazy. still stuck on the. Your PowerPoint's not running for us. Right. I don't have it running at the moment. Oh, okay. Um, All right. Just checking. Yes, it was just a smaller. This is just a um, crazy bad um, quarter crack. And, and the person who asked the question, I'm just showing you, this is, um, your horse is probably not anywhere near this, but I wanted to show you the damage that can occur on the side of the foot too. So you probably have bone loss going on over there too, and you have damage to the lamina and look at how this is all folded. So it's probably damaged and you probably have um, changes to the corium. So your lamina is probably almost creating like a scar tissue behind the wall that isn't, for anyone who's done construction, it's, it's like um, your hoof wall goes down from the coronary band, but it's covering your coffin bone and your lamina. And if there's damage behind there, the wall can frequently grow down and look fine, but that's like putting brand new sheetrock on an old rotten stud in the wall. And as long as there's no pressure on it and it's just sitting there, it can look pretty, but it's not very functional. Does that make sense? Yeah, so um, is, the, is this kind of thing something that would be visible on an x-ray if someone took an x-ray of their horse's foot with a quarter crack? Could they see this or, or does the lamina? Look, if you take that margin view, you can see. The and so, so what we're looking at here is this is a quarter crack that's a pretty serious quarter crack. A very serious quarter crack. Right. You Luckily, don't, you don't see these very often. Right. And so, so what you're saying is that as that hoof wall grows out, it may appear that we have a good hoof wall, but there's most likely scarring in the lamina. See the loss of bone right here? Yeah. And how that matches it. That matches this. So that's probably what's going on is that the horse has some internal damage. Yeah, and so without actually taking apart their feet, which is kind of a drastic thing to do. <laughs> yeah, um, I have wanted to do that, but owners really aren't. Yeah, keen they don't like it. That. So, so an X-ray might help, but the, I think I think here is where we have to start thinking about you know in a live setting. If you have a horse that's had a quarter crack, first of all, you have to resolve the quarter crack, but second of all, you have to recognize that the the tissue uh, will take time and may or may not. Um, rec recover. I mean, what I find so fascinating about the body is the ability of the body to heal. And that's yeah. what I'm going to talk about later with uh, Janet Varhouse this week is talking about the body's ability to heal. And so, you know, what's amazing is you see these structures, um, but horses can recover and they can be sound and they can be serviceable even with some of these things that we see underneath the skin. Because I'm sure there are people out there right now that are freaking out that they've seen something like a quarter crack on their horse in the past. I'm thinking about my old horse, Andy, and I'm like, and then it's my brain's going, OMG. <laughs> right, and that's where, you know, I want to reiterate, cracks bother owners more than they bother the horses. Right. And, and that it's, a blemish a lot of times. And I think the hoof 
is a very smart structure. It's built to some extent to fail. And you can have pieces of the hoof that are not functioning well, but everything else compensates. And, and the horse, thank goodness they can get by with um, subpar feet because otherwise I rarely see one that has everything working for them. And, you know, that's, I want people to see those images, but I also like having the images of the cracks and the bone loss behind them and the damage behind it. I open up my book and I show owners. I'm like, if you, you can't expect me to fix this, this is not something I can fix. I can prevent more damage from happening. That's my responsibility. The horse will either heal or not, but that's where I feel like these images and this work has been so important to give me a way to communicate uh, realistic expectations, to be able to say, you know, there is a real underlying problem. And if you don't believe me, let's get an x-ray to, I want you to see and understand, but don't make it bigger than it is. You know, if the horse isn't lame, let's just assume everything's okay. And, and just to add to that a little bit, it, we still need to make sure that we have the other parts of what I call my wheel, the teeth, feet, back, saddle rider, nutrition. Those things have to be in balance. That's and where I'm going with this. Okay, awesome. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Because, but, you know, that, that, you know, being able to just point out some of the places that there are problems, but in reality, hoof care is complicated. A lot can go wrong. Um, and the more I understand anatomy and stuff, the more I appreciate having a team to back up my work because it's not all about the foot. And the team is going to be the owner your vet, body workers, the dentist is super important, saddle fitters, trainers, and the most important is the horse. Because if we don't have health, we need the veterinarian to help us. If we've got an issue that is not needing veterinary care, but body workers just, can make such a difference in my work. Equine dentist, if you don't have good teeth, the horse really can't function very well. And I have a, an amazing story of that. Um, many years ago, somebody brought a horse down from, sent a horse down from New York to rehab with me. And I had her for four months and literally I made no difference. I, I just, I failed miserably. Nothing I did made an impression on her. So I sent her back and the woman was not real happy with me. And um, she felt like she'd wasted her money, but at least I told her and sent the mare back. And um, so she was doing, um, had the vet out. They were doing a workup. They blocked the foot. The mare was lame. They blocked the fetlock. The mare was lame. They just kept going up the body and the mare was lame. And finally the owner just was like, eh, block the jaw. And the mare went sound. And the vet's like, you know what? I think I've made the whole horse numb. I don't believe this. <laughs> so the vet came back a few days later and they started with the jaw and it ends up, she had a bone spur and she needed surgery. And that was the problem. It had nothing to do with her feet. Right. And I can imagine that was a horse that after the surgery really needed Surefoot. It needed the neurologic reprogramming because I can't imagine that you can overcome the dental problems without some of that. Um, is just my thought, but that was a really impactful situation to be in because um, literally nothing I did helped that horse. She was unimpressed with my work. Well, and, and this is, you know, so often we're looking, ah, uh, yeah, we're looking at a symptom with, you know, in the Feldenkrais work, you, you know, just because they report one thing doesn't mean that that's what's going on. That's just a symptom of something larger. And, and it takes, 
the, the concept of being a detective. I always tell people it's like, you've got to be a detective and start looking at your clues and keep searching to figure it out. Because it's, it's so often, that's an incredible example and a great example of how it, the, it, the feet were just reflecting what was happening somewhere else and you have to find the original cause. And that's been the, the biggest um, joy and heartbreak of being in this industry, both the trimming, because I'm still doing that. And by the way, it is so cool to have gone from Virginia to the desert and see the differences in the feet is just in and, and how they respond to things. Some things are still, you know, a problem and other things, I can't believe how quickly you can resolve them. Um, it's, it's fascinating, but it still takes proper diet, proper saddle fit, proper, you know, lifestyle ulcers wreak havoc on horses, you know, health issues wreak havoc on horses. And there's so many places that we do need to be a detective. You can't just because you had them tested for Cushing's three years ago doesn't mean they're not starting to have problems. And um, it's, it's complicated, but that's where building a team and looking at your horse to see if you're hitting the right problems. Mm -hmm. And, um, for example, this is my lovely little uh, cricket. <laughs> her name's Lily, but she kind of has a cricket rear end. She's a little higher in the <laughs> back end. And she had a huge infection in a molar. She is, has had tons of body work. Her feet are in pretty good shape now. She is mine, so she's a little bit of a cobbler's child. But She's one that I have got to get on the sure foot pads because she needs something else and I've done everything else in the team except for that. But this is the feat that she came with. And, and you know, I just think she had two and a half years of living with that type of, of foot. Wow, that's, that's pretty dramatic and poor confirmation so you know it just she's she does the twisting in the hocks even though her heel you know her feet i've i've tried everything i just think she needs neural programming and is that is that her bars growing all yes. the way forward and folding over mm -hmm. wow <laughs> that's much more common out here <laughs> wow <laughs> bars are very robust and look at how it even suspended her up off the yeah ground so wow that's impressive yeah and so you know to um somebody just asked a question actually uh, about hang on let me get to the question um staying with the toe crack for a minute um, okay um if on sure foot pads might we see a loading onto the pad for comfort or less or less interaction i'm not sure what she means by less interaction but the the beauty of the pads is that they're going to give to heat and pressure and so they're going to um give more and especially like the hard pad is the easiest, easiest one to describe because it has no lateral give it's just going to give direct but it'll give where there's higher pressures and and um in my opinion i think what it's doing is it starts normalizing the pressure in the foot so um if there's a crack there's not going to be really any contact in that crack area obviously but it's going to start to allow the rest of the foot to kind of find a balanced place and for as best as, you know, this is why I'm doing all these webinars, okay? To be honest, it's like nobody really understands exactly how Surefoot works because we don't have the, the data behind it, although that's gonna be coming. Um, I know it will. But in the meantime, it's like, what are we seeing? And we're seeing that there's, there's gotta be a change in pressure. And with that change in pressure, we see changes in behavior, we see changes in body patterns, we see changes in fascia, we see changes in posture. But you know the, the example is if you're walking around on stiletto heels, that's putting a lot of pressure on just you know two points of your foot, your toes and your and your heel from that spike, that is affecting the entire system. And when we could take that and say, hey, let's just put it on a surface that's going to give to the highest pressures and even things out, you're going to see a relaxation in the whole system. And so, 
you know, it's not going to resolve this. It, you have to realize what Surefoot can do and what it can't do. It can make horses more comfortable. And if there's no underlying problem, it can address habits, but you still have to go back and deal with the, um, the structural changes that need to be done, the trimming that needs to be done, the body work that needs so, to be done, the saddle fit, the training of the horse. So it, it's just one piece in this whole wheel of healthcare for our horses to help reset proprioceptors and um, you know remind the body of health. I think that's one of the things it does is remind the body, hey, you can be healthy. Well, and that's what I think Lily needs. She needs, maybe she never really even experienced health. Yeah, I mean, well, at some point those feet weren't that way, but who knows how long they have been. But for example, if, if I had the pads and put a horse like this on here, what you would see is the pads was would also point to you areas that need to be addressed. Yes. But can the imbalances here, I think, are causing a shear force because if you look, the crack is in the center of the foot. This is the center. And look at how much damage there is off center. And I think that's a shear sideways force. And I think your pads would show this shift yeah. that's that you can't necessarily see with your eyes. And um, again, all of us are giving pieces to hoof care. None of us have the complete package. And as an owner, you just have to keep sifting through and finding things that are a tool that you can use to help keep your horse as healthy as possible or to help you identify how to fix the problems. So yeah, that. and and that's exactly true. I think of the pads as being like a magnifying glass and helping us see what's there that we might not normally see because it's so you know when something's so familiar you just don't see it, right? It becomes the normal, and but yep. you need some kind of contrast, um, and I think that's one of the things Surefoot does is provide that contrast to your eye so that you can go oh wait there you know look at how the pad is shifting or how the foot is shifting on the pad. Absolutely. But again, we need a team to figure these things out. You know, yep. your, your hoof care provider is not going to be able to fix everything. Your vet's not going to be able to fix everything. The owner and the horse, the relationship you have, you're the, the center of the wheel. You're the ones that have to go out and find the pieces with different professionals a lot of times. And, you know, some horses are straightforward, but. And, um, you know, it's difficult because like I've had, I've had one person email me and um, she gave me one little piece of information about her horse and I, I gave her a suggestion, but she didn't tell me that she'd had two vets look at it and a body scan and everybody said the horse was sound, even though it's rotating its rib cage. So, you know, sometimes it's hard because we are doing what we think is best and we can't always find the answers Yes. And, and that's not necessarily the fault of the professionals. Sometimes it's just hard to find the answer. Yes. Well, and that's another reason that Jenny and I created these books too, is to, to be able to even show, have professionals be able to show owners that, come on, it's, it's complicated. It's yeah. not that straightforward. So. Um, how about unsharing your screen? Okay. I can do that. And, um, there you are. Awesome. Great. Um, and let's see, we had a couple of questions. Um, follow up question on the one about the towing in would Surefoot help identify where the anomaly originates? Maybe, um, you know, again, with it's, uh, without actually seeing the horse in front of me. And this is, this is one of the things that I talk about all the time is, um, without actually standing there and looking at the horse on pads, I really can't tell you what I would see or what is going on. And what I find again is that people don't intentionally not divulge information. They, we just kind of get used to things or we stop seeing it or it's, we filed it away as unimportant at the time. And so, you know, I, when, I, when I start a riding clinic, I always sit down and ask all my students, okay, tell me about your injuries. 
And they'll say, oh yeah, well, you know, I, I broke my pinky toe when I was two. Okay, fine. And then they get on the horse and I start working with them and I, and I, I put my hands on my students. Well, not anymore, I don't know what I'm gonna do about that, but I usually put my hands on the students and I take hold of their leg and I start feeling their ankle and I go, you know, well, what did you do to this ankle? And nothing, I didn't do anything. And then the next day I'll go, what did you, oh yeah, well, I broke it two weeks ago. And I forgot to tell you there's pins in there. You know, I mean, it's th that kind of stuff that we're designed to compensate so that we're not vulnerable. Horses and humans are designed to compensate so we're not vulnerable. And the body has so many incredible ways of doing that, like these feet. These feet are amazing, Paige, because clearly these horses were still walking around, right? Yeah. And so they weren't. Right, till they weren't. And the body compensates and adapts. And it's when we can't adapt that we're not healthy. Um, but a healthy system keeps trying to adapt and evolve and deal with and go forward. And I think that when we start to realize the, the amazing way in which our bodies can do that, you start to realize how incredible they, they are, how this incredible this thing is. And so, you know, until I, unless I see something with my own eyes and I'm standing there and I can start to investigate and ask questions, I, I don't know what's going on. And I can't say from just, you know, a, a question just written on a page. And I think, Paige, that's what really led you into doing this is that you could only see so much from the outside and it wasn't yeah. until you started going inside to realize just how, how much was going on. Yes. And it's this ability to have this insight, which I find that your work is incredibly valuable because it gives us the insight. Now, I, as I said, there are gonna be people that are freaking out going, oh no, my horse has a quarter crack and oh, look how, but you know, the, as you said, the horse is still sound and he's still moving around and we have to honor that and, and not freak out. <laughs> yes, don't tell him he has a problem. Right. You can try don't, to make it better, but don't like, don't make it bigger than it is. It's just like your little kids. You don't want to go, oh my God, what did you do when they like got up and brushed themselves off? You know, just. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> we need to keep our emotions a little in check and look at it and go, oh, that's nice. Um, Linda Tellington Jones taught me a phrase way early on. That's interesting. <laughs> that's interesting. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. You know, and so it just, because it doesn't have the emotional charge of, <gasps> you know, um, and it, and so, fire. <laughs> yeah, quick to judge. So, so Paige, people have asked a little bit about, uh, tell us more about where we can find your books, what books you have, and this online course. Is it lifetime when you sign up? That's one of the questions that we have. Okay, so the books, we have ebook versions, so you can download them onto your tablet, your computer, your phone. Believe it or not, they look really good on the phone. Um, those are all at anatomyoftheequine.com. There's dashes in between those um, words. We made it really complicated, but. Um, so we have printed versions and we have the ebook version. We have some posters, we're out of a few of them. Um, the online course, it is like streaming from Netflix. When you pay for it, you have access to it for forever is perpetual so that you can go back because the information is so overwhelming. Mm. We don't expect people and, and we need to even make a whole webinar on how to use it. And it's like, sometimes just turn off the volume and just look at the pictures, just absorb it. Don't, there's not anything you have to take away from this. We're just showing a lot of stuff and let it, percolate. And I think about that even with my animal science degree, there were pieces of that education that I got in undergraduate that I'll see a horse 25 years later and think, oh, I know what's going on. Yeah. And it's like, it took that long before that piece fit that problem. And I feel like that's what our webinars are going to do is, is you might not know how the information is going to impact you, but all of a sudden, one day you're going to see a horse, you're going to see a problem. And all of a sudden you have a vital piece of information that you makes you understand in a different level, but you're not going to be able to start it from beginning to end and, 
magically remember all this stuff. Right. Yeah. That's what I've always found with the anatomy that I've done is it's like, you have to just let it percolate in the background and then you'll be standing there and it'll pop out when you need it. Mm -hmm. really, really awesome. So, so just out of curiosity, do you know how many hooves you have dissected? I would say well over a thousand. Wow. And how I many have not, this um, photographed all of those because a lot of times, like I did a, um, one of the last clinics I did, <laughs> which those are all shut down now, um, I know. Is, <laughs> is in California. And I think we took apart like 12. Wow. So a lot of times, you know, we'll take a whole bunch apart and everybody will, you know, explore all the different issues that are going on. So I've done a lot of feet. Have, you, have you tracked at all breed differences? Um, a lot of times I don't get any history on these. Um, oh, when I got them from the necropsy okay. lab, I would get some basic history. Um, what I'm finding and I'm trying to, I, I think this is the next push that needs to be made. And it's, it's, I need, I think owners have scared the people who help them take care of their horse after they're, past and veterinarians and the people picking up the bodies or helping you bury them or whatever everybody's too afraid to to even ask about donating pieces and parts to the horses of the horses for educational purposes and it's it's like when I get legs that have a history it's like Christmas for me because it makes that horse's life have meaning that goes on. And, and, you know, it's like the, any problems that that horse, and even if it doesn't have any problems, mm. that in itself is almost more of a miracle, um, just as a way of honoring the horses forward. And I just want owners to understand that if, if they're having to make a hard decision like that, they may want to ask their veterinarian. They may want to ask their farrier or their trimmer or even a body worker if they want something from that. Do they, because a lot of people do want to donate their horses and they don't know who to ask, but I'd like to get conversations going where people realize even vet schools are struggling sometimes to find um, cadavers. Yeah. You know, I know in humans, you can donate your body to science and there's different organizations that you can yeah. work through to do that. In fact, a friend of mine's mom just, uh, just passed in that. Um, um, and it would be nice to see that we couldn't organize something because, because those horses that you have had the access to are, as you say, they're going to help so many other horses by the knowledge that they have given us. And it's a hard decision. These are not things you necessarily want to be faced with when you're in the middle of putting your horse down. This is something that it's like, it's just like being an organ donor. You really just kind of want the plans to be in place. <laughs> I figured somebody was. <laughs> That's Buster. Looking so anyway, but that's just something I want owners to understand that that sometimes, you know, think about it. If it fits your nature and what you want, just just ask around and see if there's some gift that you can give to um, yeah. help more horses. And and I think what you, you've said is really important that if we plan this ahead of time, we're not having to struggle with it during our period of grief. That, yes. it's, that it's something to think about when you're, you have life is quiet and peaceful and you have a moment to really consider, um, you know, like I've, I, uh, my friends and I, we always talk about, well, who are we going to give our horse to if we go? Um, yeah. And in the same way we could consider um, how do we want our horse to be remembered? Yeah. Yeah. So it's just, you know, it's not, it's like everything else. It's, it's not a, something you need to spend too much time over. Sometimes you just know in your heart that you want to make a donation like that. And other times, you know, it just, you can't do it. And, that well, and that's absolutely. If you, okay. um, if you um, listen to my webinar with uh, 
Pamela Eckelberger and Diane Dezingle, they have the Bone Room in North Carolina, and they have formed a partnership with uh, um, a uh, uh, what is it called? It's up in Maine where they they're composting the horses, and it's all done with great reverence and care. Um, yes. but they can they can get some of the bones to, and again for the same thing for research to make these comparisons. And so I just have to read you Heather's comment. She said, "This is such a great conversation to have." Um, in the meanwhile, she has a question. <laughs> okay, um, <laughs> it's been scheduled for a surefoot workshop. Yes, it's still on. Yes, yeah, so I am still planning to go to New Hampshire and do the Surefoot workshop in July. Um, I am not teaching for the month. Oh, compassionate composting. That's right, Diane. Um, not teaching this month, but we're working on how we're going to structure the workshop. Um, and I'm working on a policies and procedures right now so that it's clear and everybody knows what we're going to do. Um, and... Um, yeah, so as at this point in time, yes, we are planning on going forward with both the Surefoot workshop and the riding workshop. The riding workshop is going to take more thought um, and more guidelines because obviously I'm used to putting my hands on everybody, um, and so we're I've got a uh, I've got the outline, but it's being ex um, edited right now. Um, and okay, and Heather Heather has another comment that there's a farrier in Midwest. Mid Hudson Valley, New York, who put who collects equine cadavers and compost them. So there's, it sounds like there's a couple of people doing that, and that's really that's Walter Barco, and he does a lot of the big, um, he does a lot for veterinary schools and things like that. He puts the whole horse together, and oh wow, it takes years sometimes. Oh yeah, no, articulating a horse is not an easy. Yeah. Well, Paige, this has been absolutely fascinating. I'm, uh, this is really great. And so um, just again, where can we find your books? Anatomyoftheequine.com. Just put dashes between it. If you forget the dashes, it'll still, we have it it'll linked. Still so on. it'll do great. it. The, the pictures, I, they're just stunning. They're, you and your, your associate have done such an amazing job of not only preparing the specimens, but photographing and layout. Every time I see them, I'm like, they're just gor they're gorgeous. Um, and so I really thank you for your work because I know that's a labor of love. It's really not- Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to this and I've enjoyed it. Oh, no worries. And so um, that concludes our webinar for today, but you can find all of my webinars on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. If you subscribe, you'll get a notice when we put up a new email, I mean, a new video. Um, and if you are not receiving my emails to get all the links to all the webinars, please go to murdochmethod.com and sign up for my newsletter. I post a newsletter every, on the weekend, either Saturday or Sunday, depending, um, with all the links to my guests. Tomorrow is Robin Hood. We're gonna talk about being all wrapped up, using body wraps and how Surefoot and body wraps can be used together. Um, and I am planning on, I'm still adding my guest list for this month. I've got a few people I got to contact, but stay tuned. Um, and you can also go to the Surefoot Equine uh, website and see the webinars and find the links there. So thank you all for tuning in. And until tomorrow, everybody enjoy today. It's a beautiful day here in Virginia. I'm going to go outside and ride. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Paige. You're welcome. <laughs>